Hey folks, welcome to your weekly news and community spotlight from Unreal Engine. When ILM envisioned the visual effects for Solo, a Star Wars story, they wanted to raise the bar. Using StageCraft VR, their Unreal Engine powered virtual production tool, they were able to plan their shots without flying blind and get the whole team on board a moving train. In a short interview, James Klein, Lucasfilm Design Supervisor, explains how the team used StageCraft VR to design the train and understand its physical dimensions when it came to pre-visualizing the stunts. Check out our blog for the full interview and video with their team. Corn Fox and Bros, a small but scrappy team of six based in Helsinki, Finland, who has already earned accolades for its innovative mobile title Oceanhorn, Monsters of Uncharted Seas, is now looking to improve upon its original offering with Oceanhorn 2, Knights of the Lost Realm. The team is leveraging its development experience and expanding on the game's core concepts to take the series and mobile gaming to a whole new level now in Unreal Engine. We caught up with the team to learn what helped them make the shift. Proving how game engines also support military applications, Cubic Global Defense develops innovative and realistic training solutions for the United States and allied forces in more than 35 nations. Their track record is based on decades of experience in providing simulation solutions to train warfighters and law enforcement personnel. Since adopting UE4, Cubic has used it for extensive, an extensive series of DARPA projects and large-scale exercise control and management applications, something traditionally done in 2D. Find out just how they make training more effective with gamification, blending these wildly different work cultures, and what the future may hold. Currently in development by an experienced team from Proletariat Incorp, Spellbreak is a visually stunning escape into a world filled with battle mages, spells, and RPG-style gameplay. Its cell-shaded aesthetic is already gorgeous, even in its early pre-alpha state. Following along in the studio's mission to put players first, Proletariat shakes things up by flying in the face of usual battle royale conventions and adding a twist that no other battle royale game has done yet. Blending together RPG and roguelike mechanics, Proletariat is working towards an experience that balances skill, strategy, and depth that is fun for all players. We took the time to chat with three of the fine folks at this motivated studio as we discussed their desire to do something different, their mission to put players at the forefront of everything they do, and how they've leveraged Unreal Engine 4 to create a unique battle royale experience they can truly be proud of. Are you ready for GDC 2019? Join us at the show as we celebrate the game development community. We'll share the latest features coming to UE4. You'll have the opportunity to connect with us and other developers and have plenty of awesome games to play. The schedule of Tech Talks at Yerba Buena and our Learning Theater Talks is now available where we'll cover a number of topics such as the future of physics and destruction in UE4, ray tracing, Niagara, audio, animation, and more. And we are humbled to be a part of Fast Company's most innovative companies in 2019. This is only possible through the efforts of developers, partners, educators, and all of the other dedicated members of our UE4 community. Thank you so much for all of your efforts. So on to our weekly Karma Earners. We'd like to give a huge shout out to Thompson N13, Nebula Games Inc., Every Nun, Kairos, Crawley Kane, Shadow River, Maverick Tango, Cheerer, Ninjin, and BNC. These lovely folks are helping their fellow devs on Answer Hub. Be sure to share your UE4 knowledge, and you could hear your name up here too. And now for our spotlights. First up is an environment test by the incredible team at Embark Studios. They aim to push the visual fidelity on a large scale. We're talking 256 square kilometers with a completely dynamic weather and lighting system. This scene was created by just three people over three weeks using real world scanned data and procedurally placed pr objects. Our team was stunned at the quality. Great, great work. Art student Alex Taylor created this little scene, Jade Forest, inspired by a piece by Kay Tang it was a study in lighting and set dressing. They've done a really nice job recreating the scene and dressing it up. 
beautiful work. And our final spotlight this week is another student project, Fable 4-2. It's a two-player cooperative action-adventure game inspired by the world of fables and fairy tales. Both players embody storytellers singing with a raven to go across a magical forest. The project is off to a beautiful start, and we can't wait to see it in its final state. And thank you for joining us for our News and Community Spotlight. Hey folks, welcome to this week's Unreal Engine live stream. I'm your host, Amanda Bott, and with me I have Victor, other fellow community manager, but he's also your uh, instructor today. I will be. <laughs> so you'll be going over how to create a spectator camera in VR, correct? Yep. Well, I won't be making it in VR. Um, I'll be making it on a regular screen, <laughs> uh, but it's to be used uh, when you have a VR game and you want to either display something that is not the VR player's view, mm -hmm. um, or you can use it to record trailer camera, uh, trailer footage, as well as, um, yeah, you, you essentially the goal here is that you'll be able to be sort of the director of this Right. Secondary camera that's in the scene. Um, and we can also use it to make asymmetrical multiplayer games. Like, so two players on one computer, mm -hmm. one in VR, one on mouse and keyboard, maybe a gamepad. Um, and sort of what you can do with all of that. Yeah, we've seen elements like that actually in a number of uh, game jam games before, where people, it's like one person's in VR and sometimes even AR wandering around and having them interact. So it's a really cool feature that you can use and definitely very useful, again, for like trailers. You know, trying to scan something in VR, you're not always going to get really great footage. No. So, but if we know what you're doing and taking that from a separate camera, it can help a lot. So. Yeah, the biggest problem I've had with trying to record trailers for VR is the fact that you're you're like, oh, I want to gaze across this scene. <laughs> and even if you're doing it slow yourself, you look at the footage and it just looks like, oh, he just looked <laughs> all over it. So it, it takes a lot of practice to be a, <laughs> a face camera. Yeah, and your, your muscles are always moving, and so it, it's not steady. Um, so, should we get started? Yeah, go okay. for it. Um, we will be starting from scratch, um, so if you want to follow along, you can do that. Um, I'm trying something new here, which I like to do when I do um, these kind of presentations, which is to use this, uh, my control key on the mouse and keyboard to show where the, where the mouse is. You should let us know if you like that afterwards, um, or if you didn't. Yeah. Um, so, just to go over our goals, um, we want this blueprint to be able to be drag and drop into any scene, um, or even spawn on demand f if you want to use it as a gameplay feature rather than something you do um, just in the editor. <coughs> um, and I'd also like to mention that I'll release a sample project uh, maybe this weekend or so with some more bells and whistles, stuff that we want to time to get into today. Um, and hopefully there will be some stuff from questions there that uh, questions later that I won't have time to implement today, but we, uh, I should be able to do that this weekend, and then you can take a look at the project. Uh, so we're starting off, I'm in 4.21, um, and we will start off with the virtual reality template. Um, I like to set it to scalable 3D or 2D because you're turning off some things that, um, some, some things that you, if you want to crank up your visual fidelity later, you can do that, um, and then we'll turn off started content as well because we're not going to use any of that. I've already named it VR Spectator Camera, uh, so we'll just go ahead and create it. Um, let's see. Oh, the load screen is uh, <laughs> on the other screen here. It's hiding. Yeah, so we'll just be displaying me instead while it's loading. There we go. All right, uh, content browser. We are going to need that. Go ahead and expand this. So that I like the, um, the vertical view of them better than just all the folders in here. You can also go down to view options and change it to list if you prefer that. Uh, all right, so first off, we're going to need a folder to do all this work in. And the reason why I'm picking a folder right below content is because it allows us to easily migrate this to another project later. Um, and it won't have any references to anything in the project itself, except the INI file. We'll go over that in a bit. Um, so we will just go ahead and call it VR Spectator Camera. All right. Um, and, oh, right, there's one piece of preparation that I like to do in all of my projects. So I headed over to our editor preferences here. We're going to go to level editor play, scroll down, and the window size here, um, I'd like to have it being displayed in full screen. Uh, we're currently on a 1080 
uh, monitor here. So I'm going to set it to 1080. Uh, and then you can see that when I hit play in VR now, or VR preview, um, the entire um, the, the entire screen is covered uh, instead of it just being a, a small window. All right. And then second, another thing I like to do under editor preferences is to search for straighten connections. Uh, and I like to bind this to spacebar because it allows me to keep my blueprints very tidy uh, real quick. All right. Let's head over to Virtual Reality BP. We're going to open up the motion controller map, uh, which if we hit play, will immediately launch. A VR pawn that has hands. Uh, we can teleport. Most of you have probably seen this already. It also comes with a blueprint interface that allows you to tell actors to be grabbable, and we can grab and toss them. Good fun, at least in the early days of all the dev kits. All right. Um, now we're heading over to VR Spectator Camera folder, and let's make a blueprint. All right. Actor BP. VR spectator camera. Um, the reason why you might ask, why would we do this in an actor when most commonly um, we use pawns to sort of so the the player uses a pawn um, which takes the input, and the reason why is that. Um, there is only one player controller. By default, in Unreal Engine's gameplay framework, we use one player controller that is then possessing one pawn. Um, and without doing some edits to the engine or some hacky workarounds, um, we wouldn't be able to pass the keyboard or gamepad input to a second pawn in the scene. So this just allows us to very easily, uh, easily without doing any sort of networking stuff, um, we can essentially have two players on the one computer, uh, which is really neat. All right, <laughs> heading over to the event graph. We can get rid of event actor begin uh, or overlap because we're not going to use that. Um, and the first thing we're going to do is that we're going to go ahead and add component and create a scene capture component. Uh, we'll just name that leave it named by default. Uh, the scene capture component is the component that will allow us to capture um, uh, a portion of the world, the game world, uh, and then render it onto a uh, texture. And that texture is called a render target. So we're going to go ahead and close all of our post processing options here. We're not going to need them just yet. And under scene captures here in the details panel, uh, we have our texture target. Uh, and we can either just create it from right here, render target. That's how I like to do it. Make sure we pick the folder where we're putting all our work in. Render target, VR spectator camera. Uh, and there's one thing we're going to have to do, um, which is to crank up the resolution to 1920 by 1080. Um, always keep this, if, if you're doing it, for this purpose and sort of a normal aspect ratio, 16 by 9, um, you want to keep these resolutions in that aspect ratio. Um, I'll, I'll post a document later with all of them, or you can just, or you can just Google it. Uh, but that's all we got to do for the, spec uh, the render target. Um, all right, so now we have our scene capture component set up with the render target texture that we will be uh, drawing our scene to. So we'll go ahead and compile that. And to get the spectator camera to work at this point, we only need to do two things. Um, we will, on begin play, set our spectator screen mode, hook that up, to texture. These options here allows you to do um, different kinds of, of, of spectator screen modes. Um, we're going to go ahead with texture today um, because we will replace the entire view. You can also do. Um, Single eye letterbox, uh, single eye crop to fill. These are those are the two ones you'd primarily use um, to display the the VR the the player in VR his his point of view. Uh, it's also kind of cool to do texture plus eye, where on half half of the screen you'll see what we're drawing from this scene capture component, and on the other side of the screen uh, you'll see what the VR player is viewing. Uh, all of that is actually outlined in the documentation. Um, precisely how to do those steps with all the um, the correct settings to get the 
the texture to fit properly. Um, They're actually wondering, um, does the render target in 2D um, heavily tax a game? It heavily is rel relative, <laughs> um, but yes, this will add a significant cost okay. um, to your game. So, and that's why I've, if you want to use this for asymmetrical multiplayer purposes on the same uh, on the same game, you pretty much have to start out with this from the get go mm -hmm. and always play test with this in mind because it's. I think for some of the tests I did where um, I made a, a sniper scope, it was about 25%. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. But that's also when you're running it at like um, high resolution and at a high frame rate, mm -hmm. some 90. Um, and we can control that. So if you are just barely hitting uh, your performance, um, we can change, um, let's see here. Um, we can change the, the, the frame rate of how often we're capturing. Um, capture every frame, we can disable that. And then I thought we were supposed to have, that might be in the 3D widget. I'll, I'll go over some of that later. I have a passive, um, just going over some of the optimization okay. um, things that you can do to sort of balance that if you're having problems. Uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll get we to that. We can come back around on yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, we will. Uh, and then for the second function we have to call is to actually tell which texture we want to use. Um, so we'll go spectator again, and then we'll pick set spectator screen texture. And there should only really be, oh, we have a couple. We can just search RT underscore, because that's what I named it. Render target VR spectator camera. We will go, go ahead and compile and save that. And now, I almost missed one step there. <laughs> uh, if we take our blueprint, we just drag it in the scene. And I hit F to focus on it. I'm going to rotate it around so that we're looking at where our VR player is standing. And shift to drag if you want the camera to follow along. We hit play. And now we're seeing the view uh, from the spectator camera towards uh, our pawn, where we are. So if I don't have this guy here and we just hit play, you can see that. Whoops. Ah, oh, I made a thing there. If we go in here and we change it back to disabled and we run that again, now, okay, that was not intended. I'm actually <laughs> not sure what happened there. We will just pass over that extra step that I hadn't planned. This go is what development's actually like. It right? is. <laughs> I, I say that a lot. Like, obviously, I prepared some of this content, um, and trust me, it, <coughs> it, it took a little longer than what it will take here just to uh, walk through it, even though I'm talking all, all over most of it. I like to listen to music when I work. Um, all right, so we're back, and I'm going to drag that back into the scene. We actually already have it there. Perfect. It's right there. Um, it's a little lame, though, just seeing nothing here, like especially if we hit G. Like There's no indication of where our camera is, so we're going to go ahead and just add a static mesh component. Um, and this is good for the VR player, too, so that he can see where the camera is. Um, we will go ahead and let's see. Go ahead and change the static mesh to uh, matinee cam, which is uh, part of the engine content. So you don't need to start a content to, to get this. It's just part of engine. Uh, keep in mind that if you like to disable engine content when you package out your game, um, to have a smaller binary size, you're going to have to make a duplicate of this and uh, move it to a folder under content. Because um, if you disable that, nothing in engine content will work and you won't be able to see that. Uh, so we can go to the viewport and now we can see that we actually have a, uh, a camera mesh for our camera. And that also makes it a lot easier to uh, line it up in the scene. And this is only really important for now when we, as of yet, can't control it. Just hit play, make sure everything works as intended. Great. I can put on the headset, and uh, we'll see two hands waving, uh, <laughs> which obviously we'd also like to have a head. So let's go ahead and do that for our pawn. Um, I'm just going to select our VR pawn in the scene here. If you do Control e that will open up that blueprint immediately, which is one of my favorite keybinds ever in the engine. Um, and all we're going to do here is just under camera, we're going to add another static mesh. We can call it head mesh. And by default, we can just find a nice sphere. I like to use this one because it's, the size is 100 by 100 by 100. Um, we will 
make sure scaling is set to uniform, uh, and then just set it to uh, 0.5. In my previous experience, that has allowed us to get a good size for the head. Move it back a little. Let's find some uh, default. It's like a white material. Uh, it's not called default, though. I think it's just not on the white either. Is it basic? Uh, basic shape material. Perfect. That's the one I want. Uh, we'll go ahead and compile and save that. That's all we need to do the motion control upon. And this is something you do like in your own project. We're just doing this for some purposes so that we can um, see where the VR player's head is. Um, and so now, if we go ahead, oop, oop, I forgot one thing. I'm going a little fast here. Let's uh, do Control E again since I already have the pawn selected. Uh, and we need eyes. Eyes are important. <laughs> um, and we also have some default stuff we can use that for. We'll call it left eye. Head to the viewport. F to focus. I'm going to move that back a little. Maybe make it a little bit bigger. Non-uniformly scaled. And then we can go ahead and do two on. Oh, actually, I don't want X. I want it on Y and Z. And now we have a little bit of an eye there. Let's go put it. Yeah, that's great. And we will go ahead and oh, one more thing. We will make sure that this is not set to be hidden in game. That's default because these components are primarily used for debugging. Um, and now we're going to use them as art. Uh, right, I. I copied that one and we'll move it over there. And now we have our beautiful, our beautiful VR pawn here. And now, there we go. All right. <laughs> and I can see the camera in the scene there, which is great. Okay, uh, let's see here. Project setup. Um, we've now made it so that we can actually see the scene from a different perspective. Um, and the VR player can see what he normally sees. Uh, and so now we get to some of the fun stuff, which will involve controlling this camera from... I'll only be doing mouse and keyboard here. Um, but the way that I'll be setting it up allows you to very easily um, use other means of, of device input. Um, and so we are going to head over to um, the project settings. And then we're going to go down to input. And under axis mappings, you can see that we already have uh, some defaults here that comes with the VR template. Uh, and now you might think, oh, hold on there a minute. If I had any axis or action mappings, um, I won't be able to use this content in my project. Um, and I'll show you later how you can just easily grab these uh, input mappings from the um, INI file. Mm -hmm. And then you can just copy paste those uh, inside of your own project if you're intending to use this in a project that, uh, that already exists. Uh, so we will go ahead and add the first one. This is axis mappings because we actually want a continuous output of what this value is. Um, instead of action mappings, we will only give you a binary like pressed and released. Um, so the first one is going to be camera move forward. And we'll set that to be W and scale at 1. And then the other one will be S. And now you're like, well, why do we want to go forward with S? Well, this one um, axis mapping um, can allow us to, oops, I want to do one, minus one. Um, w will output one, which we will use to go forward. And then we can use the same axis mapping uh, with S to go backwards. Um, that's how most of all of the samples work as well. Like I think that's in the shooter game example. Camera move right, and we will do eight. Go ahead and find. Oh, uh, D. I hit D. I said A. Did the right thing. Said the wrong <laughs> thing. Uh, D, and then A to go left. And we got A. And we will then set A to minus one. Um, as the director of this. VR trailer, I would also like to be able to go up and down. And so move camera, move up. And then 
we'll go ahead and I hit spacebar. I should type spacebar. Pick spacebar for one. And then we'll go ahead and pick um, left shift. Obviously, you can pick your own here. And this is, I prefer to do this setup because it allows me to very easily change these key binds later on without having to mess with the blueprint at all. Almost forgot to set shift to minus one. All right, we'll drag over project settings here just so that we can have it later if you want to add some more. Um, I'm back into our uh, VR Spectator camera blueprint. Um, and the first little input um, blueprint I'd, write, I'd like to write um, is for our mouse to sort of control where the camera is looking. Um, and there is one thing we need to do for this actor to be able to listen to input um, and it's very simple. We will just go ahead and enable input. And we'll plug that in. And here I'm going to show you that cool trick. So like, oh, they're not all straight. I can just mark them and hit spacebar. And now they're all straight, which is really neat and handy. Uh, we'll just get player controller. Um, and this is some of the stuff I was mentioning earlier about only having one player controller uh, in the scene. We're, we're using the same player controller um, that is possessing the VR pawn. But this is essentially just a way for us to um, allow this actor to listen to our input. Okay, cool. Uh, all right, and so um, I, I'm going to use tick, which a lot of people say <laughs> don't use it, but for this particular <laughs> purpose, um, it is the best way to do it. All right, a little bit of water before I go entirely dry. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and add an actor uh, local offset. Um, I prefer to work with deltas and offsets rather than setting a specific location. Um, I can perhaps explain a little bit more about that when we get down to um, some more of the input stuff. Uh, I will go ahead and break this delta location here uh, because we only want, uh, for my first purpose here, we want to move in X and Y. We don't want to move up and down because I'm going to show you how you can do some asymmetrical pawn stuff. Uh, and so now we can just go ahead and get camera move forward. And you might be used to doing this. Um, camera move forward. You might be used to it looking like this. And this is actually a um, an input event that is firing continuously. And so we'd have to listen for this axis value and what it's doing. Um, instead, I am just going to get that data um, constantly on tick, and then we'll go ahead and get camera move right, and we'll plug them in there. Um, oh, right. I said, <laughs> I said I was going to do mouse movement. I actually did keyboard movement. So this is our keyboard movement uh, on tick. I will go ahead and do the, uh, the mouse movement as well, uh, and then we'll have both of it. For that, we're going to go ahead and do add world rotation. Um, actually, add actor. Add actor world rotation. That's what we want. Um, and I'm going to do something that might seem a little strange here, but it makes sense for a very particular reason. Um, I want to add a delta to the actor's world rotation um, so that I can always get the forward vector of the actor. Um, I prefer to always have the actor rotated the right way, um, just always. Um, I can't really speak for why, but whatever works to you, but that's something that I personally like. Um, and for delta rotation roll, uh, we already have default input um, axis mapping set up for a mouse, so I can just go get mouse x. We will plug that into our, p uh, that will be our yaw. That will be our yaw. Um, oh, sorry. No, no, that's right. All right. Add, add actor world rotation, get mouse x yaw. And then we're going to go ahead add relative rotation for our scene capture component. All right. All neat and tidy. I like my blueprints neat and tidy. And we will get mouse y. And like I said, these these two here, get mouse y, get mouse x, they're essentially the same idea as the ones that we set up 
um, but they already exist as default um, access input mappings. Uh, and for why, this is for, for us to control pitch. And the reason why I'm doing local uh, rotation here and world for yaw is that I only want our camera to, to pitch locally. I actually don't want our entire actor uh, to pitch. And you could do the entire actor as well. Um, this is just the way that I've done it in the past. All right, so with all this setup on tick here, so to go over it quickly, on begin play, we're enabling our spectator screen mode. We're setting the texture to be used by that system. And then we make sure that we enable input. And if we, if we didn't enable input here, these would not return anything. Um, they would just not, the actor would just not listen for them. Go ahead and save. And now if we hit play, I actually have ca uh, mouse movement where you can steer the camera. And I can also move forward. I can move right. I can move left and back. It's all working. Um, and this right now is kind of like, oh, I'm a walking simulator pawn. I can walk around. Uh, and if we try to do a little multitasking, <laughs> I can also be in VR, and I can move the camera towards me. We can wave at it. Um, and this right here could be the, the basic setup for your um, asymmetrical multiplayer game. Um, you would obviously use this actor, the BPVR spectator camera, as like your mouse and keyboard pawn or you know, gamepad pawn or, or, or both, uh, depending on how you set up your project. Um, however, this right here, it's a little hard to translate human mouse and keyboard input into like nice looking camera movement. Um, and so we are going to go ahead and I think we're at the point where um, our, all right, all right, okay. I had, I had one, more, one more step here before we start with the, the fun interpolation stuff. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that we can also move up and down. Um, and so this right here is just the example for like a typical asymmetrical um, VR local multiplayer pawn too many words, call it whatever you want. Um, we will go ahead and get our scene capture component. Um, and I'm going to get the forward vector of it. Because when we hit W, I would prefer to go in the direction that my, my camera is looking at. Um, that's why I'm working uh, inside uh, the scene capture component space. Um, we will go ahead and multiply that vector uh, with a float. And that will actually be our camera move forward. Uh, all right, so there we have that, making some space. Uh, we'll go ahead and control W to duplicate that uh, and get the right vector. Make sure that that's neat and tidy. We can also just control W that, use that again. And now we here have the forward vector. Uh, multiplied by the axis value from camera move forward, which we set up to be W and S. And this is where it comes in that we can, we can sort of use this data only to drive both forward and backwards, which works really well when you're using deltas instead of setting uh, absolute wor world or relative uh, location. Uh, let's go ahead and make these night and tidy. Night, night and tidy. Um, all right. Now we need to add these together. Make some space. And we'll split this one at the bottom because we're going to add uh, get camera move up. Uh, since we are, since I'm rotating the actor um, in, in the, uh, the actor and not just the, the, the relative yaw of the capture component, we can just straight up use camera move up um, to drive the actor, um, the actor local offset, um, and I guess I should mention that actor local um, is different from um, add actor world offset. Um, this allows us to just always add um, relative location, and and um, it allows us to always add relative location to where we are in world space. So if I say go one forward, it doesn't matter where I am in the world. I don't need to know about that. I can just say move, move one forward, and it will always be um, one unit forward from uh, where the actor is in the world. I don't need to 
get where the actor is and then sort of add uh, one unit to that and then add a to add actor world offset. Um, that's why we're using using local. All right, so go ahead and adding this here. Oh, actually, um, what did I end up doing here? Uh, okay, now I need to think, <laughs> uh, which, which shouldn't be too hard. I'm going to go ahead and, and recombine this, make sure we plug that in. Um, and what it is, what is it that I'm actually doing? All right, all right, we'll, we'll get to this. Um, I might as well talk it through so that I know what I'm doing. Uh, get forward vector, and then we're getting the right vector. Uh, we obviously want both of these um, to go into our uh, local offset right here. Uh, let me just take a breath. This is my first stream, guys. Uh, or where, oh, it's not my first well, stream, first but it's uh, live training, training in front of all of our amazing creators and developers. I'm sure I have some friends in so there. So when we send the survey later, make Section sure to give them honest like feedback. Something like that. Constructive, though. Constructive, nice. yeah. We want to keep in. <laughs> Don't talk about my hair or what I'm the clothes I'm wearing, because that doesn't really change my opinion of things. <laughs> um, all right, then. I seriously, I have a picture here of what I did, and now I honestly don't know what that note is, because uh, I've broken <laughs> it in, into <laughs> several pieces. So I'm just going to go ahead and figure this out um, a as I'm doing this. Uh, so we'll add, go ahead and add these two vectors. Uh, because we want both of them to eventually affect our outcome of this function that we're running. Uh, and let's just go ahead and plug that in and see what happens. All right, so we got movement. However, when I push S, we're going forward, and W, we're go going backwards. So, so we're, we're almost there. Um, I think I can just go ahead and, oh, right, that's what I did. Okay, so if you didn't follow that because that was a little quick, I'm going to go ahead and remove that. Um, the uh, vector addition node allows you to add several vectors, and that's what I did. And I went ahead and I, I split this right here, and now we can add our camera move up um, into Z so that we actually go up. Uh, and we'll go ahead and plug that into add active local offset, compile, save, always save. And now spacebar, we're going up. Left shift, we're going down. We are still going backwards and forwards, um, I think. <laughs> oh, I know what's going on. I did all this spiel about add actor local offset. That's because I did some experiments with that earlier. I actually want add actor world offset. Boom. Do it live. Let's do it live. All right, going to go ahead and plug that in. And make sure our mouse control is in there. And now we have full, full movement. But you can still see it's like, it's, it's kind of, it's very binary. I tap left, I go left, I tap right, I go right. Um, the mouse is kind of a little, little stiff. Um, and so it's interpolation time. Um, this is, for those of you who don't know, interpolation is just taking a, uh, a uh, linear value from, well, that's linear interpolation, also known as LERP. Um, but interpolation is just going from value A to value B, um, either by some sort of curve or just, just straight, which is linear. Um, let's see. All right. So let's start off by just doing our movement. Um, and so we're going to take all of our input, going to alt-click to unhook a node, which is very nice. Uh, we'll go ahead and v interp two, and we want to use two because it gives us, as it says in the tooltip, tool a uh, nice smooth feeling when tracking a position. Uh, if we use constant, it will have a constant rate, and I would like to have that a um, little bit of a smooth transition. Um, oops, I double click that Visual Studio. We don't need that today. Um, I also want to show you another way that you can use. Uh, you can do interpolation in blueprints. It's using this ease function. Uh, and this is great because you can actually pick uh, which type of uh, interpolation you want to use, uh, which is really useful. It works a little bit different from the, the interp nodes, um, taking an alpha uh, instead. Um, but yeah, I just want to show that because it's really neat. We'll go ahead and get our delta, world delta seconds. And for interpolation speed, we're going to pick two. And then I'll make sure to promote this to a variable. And I'm doing it in this order. I'm setting two and then promoting because it will 
immediately set to as our default value for um, for for uh, for this variable, this float here, uh, camera movement interp speed. You should always promote, um, unless you're just prototyping. Make sure this is somewhat legible. All right, I can try to make a little bit more space here. I'm not going to need that too much. All right. Um, and for our interpolation node, um, we don't want to use this as our, our current. This is actually where we want to go. Um, let's clean this up as well. And so for current, we actually want to promote that to our movement offset. Because this will be our, our actual movement offset that will be outputted from the, v, uh, the interp uh, into our uh, adduct active world offset. And so we'll go ahead and set movement offset. And to recap, um, we are going from our previous movement offset to our new one, which is based on our new input um, values. Um, and we're driving the interpolation node using delta time and our interpolation speed. And make sure to plug that into the function, otherwise nothing's going to happen. Go ahead and compile, hit save. And now, when we're moving, it's a little smoother. And if I, okay, so I'm clicking. If I let go, we're, we have a nice little drift there. <laughs> and that I, looks a little bit more, more camera-esque, uh, like you're on a, on a gimbal or, or something. Yeah, just make sure we always stay. Well, there's an automatic gimbal because we're never telling it to roll. Um, yeah, doesn't that look better? I think it looks a lot better. Yeah. And obviously, you can go ahead and control how fast you want that interpolation movement. Um, you could also multiply the actual input values, or you can go to project settings and increase uh, the scale here. If you set all of these to two instead, we would double um, the amount that we're actually moving um, in world. All right, so we got our movement interpolation. Um, and then obviously we would like our, um, when the camera looks around, uh, to also look a little smoother. Uh, so for this purpose, we're going to unhook get mouse x here. Previously, we were just piping this right into the function. Um, and now we're going to manipulate it a little bit first uh, so that when we change the rotation here, we get a little bit smoother movement. Uh, we will use f interp2. Same idea there. Uh, delta seconds, um, another value, interpolation speed 2, go ahead and promote that, to rotation interp, speed. Uh, get mouse x goes into target, and we'll do the same thing here. We'll promote current to yaw rotation delta, and then We'll go ahead and set your rotation delta. <laughs> what are you laughing about? Your incremental tidying. The what? Your incremental tidying. Oh, um, <laughs> I am kind of picky about my blueprints, and I think it also helps when you're viewing instead of it being like spaghetti. All no, the absolutely. Screen. Oh. It's important. I wasn't saying that. Ah, well. Uh, all right, then. Incremental tidy, yeah, <laughs> maybe that should be Victor in incremental tidy instead. Um, either we can plug this right into yaw, or if we for some reason wanted to call something in here later on, it helps if we actually just use that right there. I guess I should follow best practice and do the same thing over here. Movement offset. There we go. All right, so we have our um, yaw rotation interpolation set up. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and do uh, pitch as well. Alt click to unhook the, the node. Um, F in, actually, why don't we just, we can do this to save ourselves some time. We'll grab that, control W. And our target is going to be our mouse Y value. And for current, we will promote that to uh, pitch rotation delta. 
and obviously that goes into pitch. All right, compile, hit save. And now, oops, I certainly did a mistake there because <laughs> we don't have pitch. Um, didn't I plug it into pitch? Certainly did. Is there a value here that is possibly not being set? Oh, obvious, obvious rookie mistake. We're just <laughs> passing. We're just passing zero all the time here. Um, nothing's gonna happen. So we will set pitch rotation delta. And then go ahead and use pitch rotation delta. Compile, hit save. And now we have much smoother looking camera movements. And so let's see here. If I pop into VR, um, I can at least do my head at the same time. Oh, this is this is harder than <laughs> being two people. The idea here is that you'll have one person sitting in front of the mouse and keyboard and the other one being in VR, obviously. But to give some some flyby shots, zoom, and then a backward shot, and hello. I think <laughs> it's seeing me there. <laughs> Dodging your own camera. Yes, there's a lot of cool gameplay that you can do with the fact that like another player is in the same world um, as the VR player. Mm, yeah, I'm sure. Um, something that I was tossing around that I would do was like um, you tossing cubes or like the camera shooting cubes and like the VR player having to catch them. Mm. Um, something quick that we can do. Uh, we're doing on time. Wow, we already blasted through that. Okay, um, cool. Are there any questions related to anything that I've I brought up so far? Um. I mean, they were, they did mention on like UI elements, but I feel like you were going to cover those a little bit. Yes, there was a question about in the later. forums. Uh, I, I was going to get to that as well. Um, and so, for before we get into more Q and A, uh, I wanted to show some. If this is supposed to be a trailer camera, you might want to have some uh, some cool effects. So I'm going to go ahead and open up our uh, Blueprint VR Spectator camera. Um, I have a couple of options of things we can do, but the one thing that I think is the, the the basic one is to change the field of view. And this is very simple with the scene capture component 2D. Um, if we go ahead to the details panel, just search for uh, field, or maybe FOV is better. We'll get right to it. Yeah, uh, field of view. It's, it's exposed in Blueprints, and we can just manipulate this as we want. Uh, so let's go ahead and go over to project settings and add another access mapping for, uh, we'll name it camera field of view, and I will go ahead and assign that to uh, scroll, oh, it's a uh, mouse wheel, mouse wheel axis, and just scale it one. Um, you don't have to compile this or anything, it's just a, a text file that's being read. Um, and then right below our tick here, we're going to go ahead and uh, we can just do FOV, no, I named it field of view. There's one thing here that always confuses me a little bit, um, oops, that's the wrong one, which is that when you grab the scene capture component 2D and you want a uh, field of view, and then you get field of view, but this has a actually returns FOV angle, which can be a little confusing, but it is the same thing. Uh, it's just the metadata there being stored for um, what's, what's being exposed that, that differs a little. Um, and we are going to use this, uh, so might as well leave it right there. Um, Let's see. I'm actually going to do this on tick. Uh, I confused myself by initially adding the uh, the event, but we're just going to go ahead and um, let's see. Uh, all right. Uh, so what we're doing here is that we have our scene capture component 2D, and we want to dynamically adjust the field of view using our um, the, the mouse wheel on our mouse. Uh, and so the first thing we're going to do is that we're going to make sure that we um, we already have the current FOV angle. Um, and so we're going to want to go ahead and add a delta to that. And that delta uh, will be set by our uh, mouse wheel. So we will make sure this is set to zero before we promote it, because otherwise it will have a default of one, which we don't want to. FOV angle delta. Uh, and we're going to grab our scene capture component again, and we're going to go ahead and set FOV 
And see, this is what I meant. Like, it's called FOV, but we'll go field of view. It confuses me, at least. It might actually make more sense to someone who knows more about this stuff than I do, but. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, and now you might ask, but hello, we're not doing anything with the delta just yet. Like, this is not going to do anything. And you're absolutely right. This is the end result, or this is how we'll actually go ahead up, end up and set the FOV angle. Um, but we want to change this delta so that we can actually change the FOV angle. And it's time for interpolation again. Uh, so let's go ahead and set F uh, angle delta. Control, drag the node. It's like one of my... I have a lot of favorites. I should stop saying that they're my favorites. I like everything about Unreal. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and interpolate. We want to interpolate this as well. So f interp two, and current's going to be our actual delta that we already have. All right, maybe I'll clean this up later. Um, and for target, I'm going to use a multiply float. Okay, nope, nope. It's time. We got to clean this up. It's time. At least give us some space. All right. All right. And now we can just get mouse wheel axis. Did I actually go ahead and, yeah, I did add that. I'm so stupid. <laughs> this is intended to be to reset it. So let's just do that. Reset FOV. And I wanted to assign that to uh, mouse wheel. Uh, Oh, it's actually, what is it called? Like, click? Uh, uh, wheel. It's not click, obviously, because that's a mouse wheel. All right, let's just pick another key for now. I'm going to name it, let's say, H. H is great. Just so that we have it in there. All right, okay, cool. Um, all right. Mouse wheel axis is also just default from the engine. Uh, so we don't actually need to make an axis mapping for that. Forget everything I said about that. That's already set up. Uh, and we'll go ahead and multiply the mouse wheel axis that we're turning. Uh, and we'll multiply that with just a multiplier that um, can be whatever value you think. I think I'm using two here as well, um, just to get a little bit more speed to it. Uh, FOV speed multiplier. Some people like to just name them multi. I like to um, name all the variables exactly for what they are. Um, all right, and we also need to compile so that we can set a default value for this. We're going to set to two. Once again, delta seconds. And let's do interp speed of two here as well. Promote that. FOV interp speed. All right, and it's hopefully all legible. So what we've done here is that we are interpolating our mouse wheel axis value, um, which we're multiplying just a little bit to, uh, to do a more significant change in field of view than if we would just be piping that straight into our target. Um, we're interpolating that delta value, and then right after that, we are setting the new FOV angle, which we are basing off of current FOV angle plus the delta that we just computed. So we go ahead and hit compile, save, hit play, and now hopefully my mouse wheel can change our field of view, which it is. Uh, it's inverted. So what that means is that we can go right here to our speed multiplier, and we can set this to be minus 2 instead. And now when I scroll forward, we actually increase field of view. So it's essentially a zoom, um, or at least that's kind of what it looks like in the end. Someone here on the video production team can currently come and yell at me, it's, <laughs> it's not the same thing. <laughs> yeah. It's like completely different. We got a lens, and it has a field of view. And then there's, you know, like, yeah. Um, anyway. Yep. Uh, Jason's not his head. <laughs> He's nodding his head. <laughs> um, something that I haven't been doing here, just to sort of give you an idea of um, what the entirety of this looks like, I like to um, collapse these to functions. And so handle field of view. And then here for the entirety of this, we will go ahead and promote that. Not that one. These guys collapse to function. Handle 
uh, camera rotation. And then for our movement, we'll do the same thing. Right click, collapse the function, handle, camera. Did I spell that right? Nope, they're not camera movement. And now, oh, they're all looking like crap. We can just mark them. Hit spacebar, and now they look fantastic, minus the uh, obvious uh, spacing that happens there. Everyone's just going to be like, Victor, I'm so tired of watching you cleaning your blueprints. The thing is, when you later might want to use this, the project that I, I built, you're, you're going to be happy that's all clean because you're going to understand what's, what's going on. Yeah, because you plan on sharing this out, right? Yeah. And I'll have additional um, bells and whistles. Yes, some other bells and whistles. Um, obviously, I, I only showed you one here, which was how to just to feel the view. Uh, some of the stuff the project will contain is uh, like fade in and fade out, which can be a little tricky when you first start working with scene capture component because you're going to go over to all these post process effects and you're going to change them and you're going to see that nothing happens. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason being is that we need to change, uh, let's see here, uh, we need to change our uh, capture source. Um, I am not too knowledgeable about all of uh, all of these options, but you please correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially it is which pass of all of the um, buffers that's being produced by the GPU that we actually want um, to capture um, from the world. Uh, and scene color doesn't allow us to do any post-processing post effects on the capture component, so we have to change that to final color, um, LDR instead, compile and save. Uh, in the doc that will come with the template, I also show you an image of what the difference looks like. It's, it depends what kind of effects you're doing in your scene. Um, and which one you want to use. And obviously, if you don't need to use post-processing effects on the scene capture component, uh, maybe you have some other way of doing it, like putting a cube in front of the camera or something, I don't know. <laughs> um, but for post-processing, you're going to have to use final color. Um, let's see, well, how are we on time? We're, we're OK. Uh, let me go through some of the optimization, um, optimization options that we have to our disposal. Um, let's see, I did. So there's supposed to be a way that we can actually adjust the rate of how fast the scene capture component is um, capturing. I will write that up instead of trying to figure that out here right now uh, when my brain's all fuzzy. Um, all right, but some of the some of the basic ones that we can just go ahead and like toggle on and off is that uh, we can hide certain effects. So like anything with translucency or um, even possible actors, and this can actually lead to some really cool gameplay um, effects as well. Um, and let's see here, it is under rendering, oh, scene capture, all right. We go to scene capture in the details panel of the scene capture component, uh, and if we drop this drop down, uh, it gives us options here for show flags. So this is where you could turn off anti-aliasing, say if you're actually, if your render target is, is at a really high resolution, which can be hard, much harder, higher than this can be really hard. Um, but if it is, you can, you know, maybe turn off anti-aliasing and save a little bit there. Um, fog, landscape. Uh, and what I meant by fun, like, gameplay methods here is that by just toggling some of these things off, you can create um, a gameplay where the player in VR sees everything, mm -hmm. but the mouse and keyboard player, he doesn't. He can't see it. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, and there's also another cool way that you can actually do that. And so you're all like, oh, but we all want to see the fog. And like, <laughs> we all need anti-aliasing. Uh, you can also go ahead and set, um, OK, that's not the one. Uh, we can specifically, if we have our scene capture component, uh, we can go ahead and hide uh, hide actor components and hide component. Uh, not sure if there's an actor. But obviously, you can you can grab all of the components. This will actually hide. Um, oh, it does. Ah, okay. So it takes the target is actor, um, but it will hide all of the visible components of this actor. And that way, you can have like, oh, the um, the player who is you know using the spectator camera, um, he can't see any enemies, for example. Mm. But maybe he's the only one that can attack them. And so the VR player got like, he's right there. He's right there. Or to get you to run away from them. And yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's plenty of things you can, uh, <laughs> you can do there. Um, and that's also just default exposed um, to the scene capture component. Um, another uh, simple way of, of optimizing this, and this 
depending on what you're doing. If it's for gameplay features, uh, you can go ahead and lower. Uh, the re this will probably be the most significant. Uh, this is the most significant performance control you have over the scene capture. Um, is by setting the outputted resolution, um, what we're outputting to this texture. And so for gameplay features, you can go ahead and lower this to whatever you're comfortable with. But when it comes to capturing trailers, you probably want them at a 1920 by 1080. Um, and I would suggest at that point, if you're like, oh, but like our game is just hitting uh, you know, the threshold on our minimum, um, uh, minimum computer requirements, mm -hmm. um, perhaps you can you know, find a higher-end PC to record a trailer on um, yeah. and then possibly being able to, um, to hit needed frame you rates. You definitely want to export as much or have as high a res yeah. resolution as possible for those kinds of things. So. I would also point out that for a trailer, if you're, you know, barely, just like you're dipping a little, little below 90 frames per second, which is what you're supposed to hit, no one will see that because you're capturing it from, um, th this is a little bit. I'm not saying a lot because then yeah. you'll actually see a uh, stutter on, on the motion controllers mm -hmm. and the camera. Um, but if it's just a little, uh, you can still go ahead and get really decent um, trailer camera footage, um, which is neat. Um, I think I'm ready for for some questions. Yeah. If uh, there were any. There's been a couple. So one, it was the, there's been a couple folks asking about the UI elements. Right. Um, if you want to, do you want to do that? I do. Okay. Um, so by default, without doing any major changes, we have no way of displaying um, a UMG widget sort of in this texture. Mm -hmm. And there's no default way that we can apply it sort of as part of, of the spectator screen system. And so the way that I've had to do it in the past, and this is a hack, you can do it differently in C++, I'm sure, but if you want to stay within Blueprints, it is entirely possible. What you do is that you actually end up making a 3D widget component in the world that you attach to this, uh, in front of the scene capture. Mm -hmm. um, and so what's essentially happening is that you're rendering a widget in the world that just happens to be attached to the camera um, and, and, and it's, it's in front of it. Mm -hmm. um, and you can hide that for the VR player um, as well. That's the way to do it. And then um, you go in and so sort of, if we're pretending that uh, this event here, um, enable, let's call uh, spectator menu, uh, menu UI, sure, that kind of works. Um, if if this was the button or, or event that called it, um, you got to make sure to enable, um, let's see, uh, game input. Um, yeah, so we got to change input mode to make sure that it's uh, UI, um, game, game and UI. Problem there is if you click outside of the widget, I believe, you'll get taken back to the game. Um, you also got to do some other stuff like show mouse, which is actually in reference to the player controller. And then show mouse cursor. Um, so a couple of these things. All of, excuse me, all of this, um, I I'll, I'll set this up um, in the sample project with a little bit of fancy math that I wrote that allows us Ooh. to get, um, so let's see if I can do this and then shift OK, now you can see the mouse, so I can show. Um, that allows us to take the mouse position in the viewport and properly translate that in like the exact location behind the mouse in our viewport on top of the widget. Because mm. that's a little tricky because of the, the difference in where that menu the actually depth, yeah. yeah lives in world space and the size of it. There's a little bit of tweaking there involved, um, but I'll set all of that up. Um, I did build an asymmetrical game like that. Um, where it was a point-and-click adventure, okay. and uh, the v the mouse and keyboard player only had that menu to like click, like go here and, and do that. Oh, and inspect this and like highlight this, hmm. okay. um, which is kind of cool. Yeah, make sure we say. Yeah, they're wondering if you can lock the mouse to the widget, actually, um, or is that something you'd want to do? Um, if you, I guess it depends on how you're navigating. Yes. And when you use um, this input mode, I think there's input mode for only UI as well. Yeah, UI only. 
um, if you use this, the mouse shouldn't leave your monitor. Is that is that what they meant? Or maybe they meant if you have a smaller the menu. if you have a smaller widget, um, you could you could set in some just like you can just clamp the allowed uh, vector like to the uh, to the vector offset. You can just clamp that. Um, and you can you can either manually try to figure out what that clamp should be, um, or I'm sure you can do more fancy math, um, <laughs> which is optimal in case you ever want to like and uh, change the size of the widget. You know, which you you tend to do a lot of uh, dynamic yeah, yeah. Um, changes in your design decisions throughout the project. And so I always recommend to build everything in a way that it makes it easy to change it later, mm -hmm. um, especially when it comes to these things. So definitely possible, but it would be a manual. There's no just like lock it, because it's essentially a hack that we're doing um, to be able to do that anyway. Um, let's see. They're wondering if you use screen or world space for the UI positioned in front of the camera. Uh, that is so. Um, I can show you real quick if we make another blueprint. Um, we'll just call it BP 3D widget. Um, we will add a 3D widget, widget, um, oh, it's no one called 3D widget. I think it used to, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, like. this is a uh, widget component which allows you to place a UMD widget in world space. Now, it would be attached to the camera, so, you know, it's relative to the camera, but it actually lives in world space. Mm -hmm. We are not adding it, um, like you, you tend to do, what is it, viewport, uh, that's focus, what is it, add widget, widget, uh, oh, Jesus, I forget what it's called now. I've been doing VR for so long that some of these, uh, <coughs> well, by default, there is a function that we need to call to add, add the wi vi widget to viewport, and that's yeah. not what we would be doing in this case. Um, because we actually have a 3D widget component that contains a, um, a UMD widget. And it, this, this actor or component, uh, depends on how you want to set it up, that will live in world space. Um, and you, ca you, can, you can see it there a little bit when I'm moving it around. Like there, it's actually drawing sort of a canvas uh, right there. Uh, and this would be then attached to um, your, your spectator camera. And then when you would fly that around, it would just it would just follow in world space. Try to make a viewport a little bigger. Yeah, um, I'll I'll make sure to write up some a little bit of documentation on that as well. It is a hack, um, you know, not the typical way that we would do it, but any way that works is okay, um, in my book, as long as it doesn't break your project two years later. Um, All right. Um, so you're demonstrating currently on Oculus, but uh, Vive would also be applicable. D uh, just drag and drop, no changes. They're wondering if can you also does it also support PSVR? I believe it would. There is nothing here in any of the logic that I've used um, that is specific to any uh, VR hardware. Um, I do know that. PlayStation on PlayStation, some games they have, um, they have, a, they have like a, I think they call it like a social view, where mm -hmm. you can do essentially this. Some of the games, I think even like the the, the first game you play, like the demo pack example, uh, that's what they have. So there might be um, a different way you do it on PSVR. I'm not entirely sure, um, but in terms of all other PC, um, all other PC um, pieces of VR hardware. Uh, this this will work out of the box. You okay. just need to make sure to have the right plugin uh, installed by default, which by default they all are enabled. Mm -hmm. um, we both have Oculus. Uh, we got Steam VR. All right. Yeah. So not sure. I, I'm actually not sure if this, if these functions will do the same on PSVR, uh, but that will be really easy to test. But we can look it up. Yeah. Um. They're wondering, how can you set a lower frame rate for the scene capture? All right, so I know it's possible to do this, and I have done it in the past. <laughs> uh, Nothing like development on the spot, huh? Okay, so <laughs> uh, 
th this is one way to do it. Um, we can turn off capture every frame. Um, and then, and we would, in this case, also turn off capture on movement. Um, and I thought, I guess that might actually just be in the widget component that we can set the, uh, um, the sort of refresh rate of it. Um, but what we could do here, if this is like a concern, you're just, I just need this, is that uh, on tick, we can decide a frame rate multiplying delta time uh, or taking delta time into consideration and then only execute that every so-and-so. Actually, we can do it even, even easy, easier. Uh, set timer by event. And event, custom event, capture, spectator, view. And here, we'll take our scene capture component 2D. And we'll type in capture. And then we have the function to capture scene. And so say if you want uh, 10 frames a second, we'll do point 0.1 here. Um, hook that up. Let's, let's actually let's, let's just do this. We will do this on begin play here. All right, uh, make sure it's looped. Uh, and so now we're doing it 10 times. Let's say 10 times a frame. I meant 10 times a second, which would be 10 frames per second. And so now you can see that it's only capturing um, every 0 0.1 seconds. Obviously, I mean, that, that could be some kind of effect. I don't know if that's, that's what you're doing. You shouldn't have to go that low. Um, 0.3 might be closer to what we want. So, oh, oh, I, I'm. So we want it even lower than that, of course. So that would be like 0. Point, so I know that 0. 0.011, that's around 90 times. So 0. 0.05. Uh, so it, it looks all right. I'm not sure how it's coming through on the stream either. Um, as long as you can stick with a higher, higher frame rate, I would suggest that. Um, but this is, as far as I know right now, there might be a parameter here that I'm missing. Um, but this is one way how you can do it manually uh, by just capturing the scene. Oh, and say if, I don't know, this was like some kind of a, um, it was like a, a, a you know, single picture camera, um, you can use this function to just capture that scene. Um, you could also, I think, take this texture and render that in like, a material that's applied to like your photo book, and then <laughs> you <laughs> <Yeah>. can the <laughs> it can be like I don't know the flying camera fairy and um, <laughs> taking pictures for you while you're on your adventure. Just um, imagine it's like Mavi, just like taking pictures of <laughs> yeah, something like that. Um, Link being a being such a troll. Yeah, I'll figure out if there's a the more more proper way to do this. Um, I thought there was one here, but maybe not. <coughs> you can follow up there. Um, yeah. They're wondering if it's possible to send vendor target references over the network. So you're doing it locally in the blueprints. Um, can you do it with C or with C++ and then get it from another device? So, for example, a client in Eventic. You so you could oh. network. <laughs> um, yes, I wouldn't, because sending that that is a lot of data, mm -hmm. and especially doing that nine times a second, like on blueprint tick. Um, if that's your only thing you're doing, and maybe it's on a local network, yes, that could work. Um, but you don't need to send that data over the network because if you already have a, a network environment um, with, with two players and maybe one is a listen or you have a dedicated server, they can capture the same thing. So player A can capture what player B um, mm -hmm. is doing uh, locally. So, so player A will have this spectator camera and that will see, you know, what what the second player is doing. So I'm not sure what the exact um, I mean, I know use we case would be. did stuff like that for some of the demos we worked on, even at NVIDIA. Um, we had multiple, it was like a multi, it was the holodeck, and so there was a uh, multiplayer scene, and we would all come in, and, you know, we each had our own viewpoints. And then we had another person that was networked into this, client or the server mm -hmm. and they were just the spectator and that was the camera that we actually showed the demo from yeah so uh you can absolutely do that can be done uh yeah but you wouldn't be sending the the texture data across the network you don't need to do that you're just a camera you're you're, just, you're a camera you're that's a capturing camera. the data mm -hmm. so it's a different setup it is it is yes you wouldn't actually need to do any of this spectator stuff because 
you in that case you can actually have a pawn yeah. that is possessed by the player controller on that PC. Um, that's actually how I used to do um, this. Like that's how I used to record before. I think. So this setup's preferable if you're doing something local. Correct. But then there are ways to set up for multiplayer or networked clients. Correct. And, or s setups. The but only problem there, if that is not intended to be a multiplayer game, you're doing a lot of extra work to make sure that all of your game mechanics work across the network just for that spectator. That's how I did it before 417. Yeah. Um, when I believe uh, the spectator screen mode uh, was released um, in the engine. So... I wouldn't recommend sending the texture data over, um, but using another client, and like if you want to use some stuff like the character movement component um, and have all of the uh, the, the client-side um, movement authority and, and, and all of the neat things that comes with the, the, the character movement component, you should definitely do that. But there's no, you don't have to use spectator screen mode um, in that setup. Because hmm. spectator screen mode is, is, this right here is only for uh, if you're doing it on one on one machine. Gotcha. Um, I think you're doing a live motion capture event where the user wears the motion capture suit and VR headset, but they want to have a spectator camera. Do you reckon it'll work on a single PC, or would a second PC for a specta spectator be recommended? Mm, depends on how how much load is put on that PC, mm -hmm. um, but it's absolutely doable, and this is the way you would do it. Um, and I'm, and and you can you know do whatever setup you want with several monitors, and then output this preview window um, to whichever monitor you want all of your spectators in the studio to uh, to see. So um, in that regard, you got to balance like m maybe you don't have enough like horsepower left to to drive this, mm -hmm. and depending on like how complex, if that scene is literally just like. Um, motion capture data, yeah. you might want to do that across the network instead, um, but definitely try to do it on the same PC uh, first, because it will be a lot easier to uh, to manage and set up. Like that, it would literally just be this, what I did right here. Um, yeah, and that's really cool, by the way. I want to see who <laughs> does that kind of stuff. Yeah, real yeah, time share that project. Real time mocap, and when like you can <laughs> you can see yourself, even if it's just on a monitor in front of you, yeah. it's super immersive. Um, yeah, you can be a zombie and <laughs> get your hands Yeah, that's what you're talking about doing to me today. I I didn't think we were going to mention that. <laughs> yes, I did discuss actually uh, preparing a um <laughs> a different head and then having Amanda in the headset and um she could go around. I'm actually not sure what happened there. I broke something. But Well, all right. Is there anything else you wanted to share today? Mm, let's see if I had anything. Oh, yeah, uh I do have time for one other thing that's kind of cool. Uh, the VR template comes with um, just a, a simple system for, for grabbing, uh, grabbing actors. Uh, and if you want to sort of expand upon that and um, be able to grab other actors, uh, we can do that really easily. So we can actually take our VR spectator camera and make that grabbable real quick. Um, since this will be something that is specific to this project and how they implemented grabbing, I will go ahead and inherit um, from the spectator camera. VP VR spectator camera uh, pickup. And if we open that up, we head over to class settings. Uh, all we have to do here, actually, is two things. First, we have to add a blueprint interface, which is called pickup. And this comes with the VR template. And once we've added this interface, uh, to to the actor. Let's get rid of all of this because we're not going to need it. Um, we can listen if any any other class is telling us that like, hey, I want to pick you up. Um, so if we don't have this interface uh, here, and actually let me go ahead and show you the interface as well. I think it's here. Uh, pick up actor interface. So blueprint interfaces is, is a great way to make s like an agnostic way of um, calling functions on actors that you don't necessarily need a hard reference to. Uh, this is one of the most preferred ways of doing it because it allows you to build your product in a way that you don't have a bunch of references to things um, and they get deleted and now you, you get errors. Uh, with a Blueprint interface, um, you implement it and 
any um, any actor can send messages to the actor that implemented this interface. Uh, and you can see here that we have pickup and drop. Those are the two ones that's been implemented. So on pickup, let's go ahead and attach to component, I believe self is actor, parent is component. Perfect. And we're getting that patched um, through that interface. We'll make sure and change this to keep world, all of them. Um, so let's attach, and we can also do uh, disable input. What I'm doing here is that I'm making it so that the VR player can grab the camera um, to use it as like a selfie cam or um, a GoPro or something. Uh, we'll disable disable input, uh, and then when he drops it on event drop, um, we will just simply detach from actor. Uh, we'll also make sure we keep world. Um, and then we will... So what I tend to do here is that... So this function right here, this, we're back in the, in the parent class. Um, if I just go ahead and collapse this into a function, initialize input, then I no longer have to have more nodes than necessary. So we go back to our, our child. And we can just go ahead and initialize input again. Oops. That was the event. We don't want to override it because then nothing would happen. And we'll go ahead and initialize input. All right. Let's compile that. And now if we... Uh, oh, what happened with input there? Did I, uh, did I break everything here? <laughs> oh, right. Um, I forgot. I removed our um, little optimization that we did here. Um, we also got to go back and um, turn back on that we want to capture every frame and sure capture movement too is great. We got to hit play. All right, so we can fly up there, get real close, and then put on the headset, teleport a little closer. And now you're wondering, like, oh, well, you're not grabbing. And that is because the default mesh that we're using for the camera does not have collision. So this goes back a little bit to what I mentioned about making a copy of it. So we can go to engine content, matinee cam. Uh, we will control W to duplicate that, SM matinee cam, just to have it the opposite way. We will move that to our folder so that we can just migrate this very easily later. Um, move the search there so we see everything that we're working with currently. Uh, matinee cam, and let's just go ahead and add a, uh, a simplified collision of some kind. Uh, accurate enough for our purposes. Save that. Um, it should be enabled by default because I didn't mess with any of those settings. Oh, how about I? Tr what if I teleport to the camera this time instead? Huh. Okay, still no, <laughs> no collision. Oh, oh, because this right here is our parent. I never replaced it with the child. So one easy way to do this, first make sure we save that. We will select the one we want to replace with in the scene, and then we right click, replace selected actors with spectator camera pickup. Uh, oh, I also got to tell it to use this one. So let's go to our parent class and replace the static mesh we're using uh, with the copy that we just did, which is SM matinee cam. Compile that and save. And now, third time's the charm. Everything is just going to work. Mm -hmm. Now we can grab Ooh. the camera. And so <laughs> now I have my own little camera. Um, That's really cool. By default, you can oh. see that we can do some strange things that you probably don't want to. So you can, I think in my template, I, I added a, um, just something simple like uh, on detach, set world rotation, uh, set actor. Actor rotation, <laughs> and we just want to go ahead and zero out um, our role. So we'll just get actor rotation. I think by default it is actually grabbing the actor and not. Um, we'll go ahead and leave pitch, and y'all plug that in. And this is just to reset that role because obviously that doesn't look too good when you when you just drop it. There we go. So like, even if you get that slight little tilt, it will just 
autocorrect itself. And you could certainly add things in to ease it in to that mode as opposed to snapping. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, we could we could do. Uh, there are many ways to do that. Yeah. Um, after that, um, could also just something that's cool. Uh, just to be quick on tab keyboard event, uh, we can go ahead and set spectator screen mode to disabled. Um, just for this simple purpose, we know that it's on by default since we're running it on begin play. So on pressed, uh, we'll disable. Actually, let's just use a flip flop instead. Flip flop. <laughs> flip flop is good. This is a macro that. First time it executes, it fires A. Second time it executes, it executes B. And so the first time, we will disable it. And the second time, uh, we can also go ahead and do this. Right here, we'll collapse this to a function. Initialize spectator mode. And now we can go ahead and use that here. And so now, we hit play. Uh, we can switch between, this is the spectator mode, and, oh, right, if you just <laughs> do, disabled, how did I do this? It's not supposed to be that hard, I just can't think right now. <laughs> oh, right, we're just disabling everything entirely, so yeah. let's do a uh, single eye crop to fill. And then we are actually going back to the... The VR camera's perspective, mm -hmm. and now we're back at the spectator mm -hmm. cam. So that can be good too if you're doing VR trailers, and I'm sort of the director here um, saying what we're supposed to capture, and you're like, nope, I want, I want this from the VR player, like, because it's cool. And then you're like, oh, but that's a cool shot. I'm going to gonna fly in there and, and just change field of view and, yeah, try to aim. Uh, something that I was going to add in the sample product was when you inc uh, decrease field of view, the mouse gets really sensitive. So I wanted to um, decrease the sensitivity of the mouse um, depending on like how far you, uh, how much you've decreased your field of view. So that's that's also something you can do, and there are more things you can do. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so it's it's kind of what you're doing, but is they're asking, can you? Exp Explicitly set which screen to render the spectator window to in case you have multiple windows. Um, multiple windows as in screens. That's what I'm thinking. Okay. That's what it sounds like. Um, if if you're doing this in editor yeah. and not a packaged game, mm -hmm. it's fairly simple to just um, hit shift F1. Actually, <laughs> okay, since I've set our... Uh, <laughs> I can't do that because I changed our editor preferences, but I can change that back real quick to show you. Um, obviously, this might be so basic. You're like, "Oh my God, Victor, why are why are you, why are you showing me this?" But let's just go like That's 27 inch know. instead. I guess so. And I don't know what people know or do not know. And so, oh, I guess it like that. We're not on a 20, 27. Um, let's just go uh, 1920 by 1080. And hit play. I um, guess it doesn't like changing that back at all. Um, hmm, that's strange. I wonder if we can just do... Uh, oh, yeah, so uh, <laughs> you can do um, just hold, yeah, windows and then keys right and left, and that's how you can actually move change. Move it around. Move it around, yeah. Um, but works. explicitly stating which monitor it comes out of is... There's, mm, not so as much. far as I know, no way to do that using Unreal. Uh, I mean, it might be there under editor yeah. preferences, but I, I don't think so. Um, but you can, you know, change which display is your primary mm -hmm. um, and yep. swapping around like that. That's just default Windows. Cool. Uh, Windows stuff. All righty. Well. Are we, uh, is there anything else or are we, are we done for today? We are done for today. Done you for today. You made it to the end of the live stream. I did it. I'm still breathing. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> claps for Jason over there. Yeah. Awesome. His uh, first time, too, actually. So. Yeah, we have someone new behind the scenes. We do. Not an sure. old, a new, new old person, an old new person? New old person. New old person. He used to run the streams, but back for Unreal Tournament, and or original Unreal Engine, when they first started. So, we're happy to have Jason back. Um, 
But yeah, so nice work. Thank you. I feel like folks gleaned a lot and are still excited about VR. So it was nice to, it's been a while since we've done a VR one and yeah. definitely even longer since we've had a, a headset on the stream. I made sure it all worked <laughs> on the live stream PC because uh, I'm a fan of VR if you come in. Yeah, bit of an, a, a VR enthusiast. Yes. <laughs> you can call um, me that. If you have feedback for us, how the stream went on, um, things you'd like to see us improve, or what topics you'd like to see in the future, I've tossed a survey in the chats. Please let us know. It's the best way for us to offer the content that you need to you. Yep. Um, these streams are for you, so it's best if we know what you want. Um, and if you include your email address, we'll pick one of them from each uh, survey and t send you a t-shirt. So yeah. you could get some Unreal Engine swag. No harm in that. Uh, also, always check for local UE4 meetups in your area if you need help or you're looking for fellow devs to play test your game um, or just looking for, you know, cool people to hang out with. It's a pretty rad community. Uh, if there isn't one in your area, you can always start one yourself. Um, again, that's meetup.com slash pro slash slash Unreal Engine. Uh, Want to talk about spotlights? Sure. Um, we tend to look on the uh, release channel of the forums. so. If you make something cool and you post it there, we will see it. Um, and if it's your lucky week, we will make sure to um, spotlight you on the stream. Um, yeah. We also check out the work in progress. So yeah. if sometimes you know, not a lot of people are releasing things, but yeah, yeah um, pinging us on Discord, on Twitter, uh, all kinds of places. Hey, even if we you are don't, looking for it. don't feel like doing it on a forum, just you can you can ping us on Discord or or the forums as well. It's mm -hmm. like hey, like I just made this. Like we'd love to. Um, see everything that you make. And uh, and uh, we also have a community at unrealengine.com alias. So you can send projects directly our way using that e email. Or we have this lovely five-minute countdown at the beginning of our streams. If you take roughly 30 minutes of development, record that, compress it into a five-minute video, be sure to send over the name of your studio, uh, the name of the project, and we'll work on getting that to our video team to have it uploaded. Um, people are talking about the Discord. It's We're just referring to unrealslackers.org. Um, all of us community managers, so Victor, myself, and Tim are all in there. Yep. And you can scream and shout at us <laughs> about all kinds of things. All kinds of things, <laughs> yeah. Uh, or just see. talk. Yeah. We prefer that. Yeah. We like talking. Um, but yeah, watch us on all things social, um, you know, whether it's Twitch, Twitter, uh, Facebook, Reddit. we're around, keep a hold of us, or get in touch with us, and, you know, uh, none of this would be possible without all of you, so we're glad yeah, you're around. Yeah, love you guys. And, and next week, we will have uh, Jay here. Jay uh, Hosfeld. Jay Hosfeld. And the animation master. Yes, who was here when uh, Gwen was here, mm -hmm. uh, showing kind. Uh, he's absolutely amazing. I had a, a very long chat with him that was <laughs> supposed to be just like, hey, can you do it? And we spent the next two hours, I think, <laughs> talking about all kinds of things. <laughs> that sounds um, like Jay. <laughs> so be excited for that. I am. Yeah, we'll do some follow-up, I think, on turning and a number of different animation stuff. So we're yeah. excited to have him back. He's like animation um, animation pro in Unreal. And he'll be at GDC, so if you're there, yeah. you can even track him down in person and talk about all things animation. So. And wish us luck, because we're going to review all of your... Um, all the Game Jam all games. All the Game Jam games, yeah. That's, that's, our <laughs> that's our biggest task coming up. Pretty excited. There were yeah. lots of really great content. Oh. So you guys crushed it. And uh, we'll see you next week. We will. Bye, guys. Bye.